This episode is brought to you by the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control. Go to aaomc.org and join us. Join the war against the myopia epidemic. All right, welcome back to The Corrected View. This is a podcast about ortho K. This is a podcast about myopia control and the people devoted to its role in specialty care. And I have with us, as uh, usual, my co-host, Dr. Nick Despeditas, who's here to answer your practice management questions. We're going live, so any viewers that join us may ask us questions in the moment. Uh, Nick, welcome back to the podcast. Yes, Happy New Year, Matt. Definitely. I've started off the new year recovering from COVID, and oh, I also Lord. have, I don't know if you can notice, uh, you see this, I have some... Uh, uh, the iocordiolum there, yeah. It, yeah, it's not a sty because there's no tenderness or pain, and it's it's just, I don't know what's going on here. We're, we're just a little bit agitated on my eyelids, so... <laughs> All right, well, warm compress is an aggressive massage. Warm <laughs> compress is aggressive massage. You got it, you got before it. Before it gets infected. Yeah, like I, I'm just I'm I'm making use of the fact that I have an optometrist on with me to help me with my <laughs> eye. All right. So the reason why we have Nick on is to answer practice management questions. He runs a great workshop at Vision by Design called Supercharge Your Practice. And if you have any questions for Nick, feel free to send them to thecorrectedview at gmail.com or put them in our Facebook group, or you can get in contact with Nick. We'll give his information out at the end of the episode. All right. So Nick, we're going to start with one question here that was sent in. It says, hi, I'm an optometrist who is just beginning my journey into myopia management. I've listened to some podcasts with you as a guest and appreciate all the advice you give. I had a few questions regarding your process and fee schedule. I know you do the telehealth history call and the assessment. I understand the basic follow-up type schedule. If you go with ortho K example, one day, one week, one month, so after that time or after starting atropine or soft multifocal contacts, how often do you see your patients back? So Nick, what do you think? Yeah, I like to see them back regularly. This is a personal choice and I'll explain our reasoning for doing this. We check them back every three months during the first year at a minimum. Sometimes it's a little bit more often if I change a lens and I want to see the effect of the change sooner. But as a rule, we see them three months, six months, nine months, and then we'll do their checkup at the 12 month mark with their annual exam. The reason we do this is for several reasons. One is we wanna monitor the fit. And we find that six months, especially in a new fit is, is too long. When things go wrong, we, they go wrong uh, usually within a few months, not six months. So we do that. The second thing we do is obviously check to see if there's any myopia progression. Uh, we do this with a refraction. Uh, right now, because A-scan is new to so many of us, we're actually doing it more often, but not discussing it with the patient until we get our normative data and get the data on normal growth versus abnormal growth. As that becomes more mature, we'll be able to do this at a more sp spread apart interval. But the third reason is, is we like to bond with the patient. You know, we've, we've been doing these interviews now, Matt, for several years. And the way I've grown my practice is creating raving fans, raving patients, raving parents to go out and get the word out that our practice is different than most other practices who are offering myopia management. And the best way I found to do this is to talk with patients at every visit. I could talk to them about cell phone use, sleep or lack thereof, outdoor exposure or lack thereof, things of that nature. So each time slot is 20 minutes. And 10, minute, 10 minutes of that is probably gathering objective data. But the other 10 minutes is explaining to the parent, whether it's the fit or their, their hygiene environment, their environment. And that has allowed us to really solidify our myopia control practice. Gotcha. And I think it's important to add also, because I get this question a lot is, uh, you know, how do you assess how much outdoor time to recommend to a patient? If, you know, like, should you be saying like, if you're going to read a book, you should read it next to a window 
uh, you know, you should make sure you get X amount of sunlight or, or, or X amount of computer time. So how do you assess, uh, is it done individually or do you have like a, just a template? Yeah. That's a great question, Matt, because I get it every day, every 20 minutes and it's individual. You know, when the pandemic started, which we're still two years into it, we're still right now have a spike in my community. So parents want to know, you know, how much time do, does my child need? So two years ago, I'd say two hours a day. I figured kids are remote learning. They have the two hours. It was springtime of March 2020. Nobody listened to me. Not, I can't remember one patient say to me, Yes, Dr. D, you recommended we go out every day, two hours, and we have achieved that goal. No one. So I really cater it to the patient. Right now, I'm down to 20 minutes a day because it's wintertime here on the East Coast. The kids are back in school, at least they were, and they get home 3.34 in the East Coast. It's getting dark 4.35. So I asked the child, in your school day, do you go out for lunch? And surprisingly, the answer is increasingly yes, more and more. I think it's for COVID safety. I think the, the word may be getting out. Our kids are not getting outside. So it seems like kids are getting out 20 minutes a day at a minimum. And then I said on the weekend to the parent, we have an opportunity to catch up. So go for a walk with your child. Go golfing with your child. Go play, do any activity. And it is individualized. So it stirs up conversation, just like we're doing now. And parents get excited. Nobody talks to them. So at least I'm talking to them about relevant topics. They know they're not perfect. I'm not expecting them to be perfect. So then when they go home and one of their friends says, I noticed Johnny's not wearing glasses anymore. Where do you go? That allows for a parent to explain, listen, our office is different than most. This doctor talks to me. Right, right. Definitely. It reminds me kind of of what, uh, I was talking with Caroline Kauke, who we both know, and she was saying that like in her, in her opinion, parents today want to be their kids' friends. That's how she phrased it. And there's, there's a struggle, you know, like when I was a kid, if, if I was in front of the screen too much, my parents would unplug it, take it away and say, get outside and don't come back until lunchtime. Right. So like, uh, do you, I, 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 I look at the modern optometrist and I'm thinking this has got to be an intimidating prospect. They have to be like a coach, a nutritionist. They have to advise the parents on technology use. And then you get parents who are just like, I can't get them off their device. What do I do? My answer would be take the device away from the kid. You're the parent. But do you find that that's, that that's a, a thing that you encounter that you have to like be the authority on this and kind of coach the parent as well? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think you don't have to give specific advice. But, you know, as a health provider, I do think we have an obligation to at least recommend from our perspective what the parent should be doing. So what I tell them is I don't get as specific as take the iPad away. I say we really don't know how much screen time is too much because it's probably different for every child. But it seems the consensus is Limits are better than no limits whatsoever. And we don't know if the limit should be this narrow, like you said, take it away, no TV, no iPad, or this, but we do li limits matter. So the three rules I give every parent is number one, no cell phone, no iPad in the room when the child's sleeping. Let them leave it outside, even if it's off, even if the child uses their, their iPhone as a uh, alarm clock, it stays outside the room. The second rule is I don't want the child to multitask. So I don't want their device, their iPad, their phone next to them as they're doing their homework so they can watch YouTube or I am their friends. So the phone stays outside the room. And the third rule is when the child's eating, I prefer they're not looking at a device. Either get bored or talk to your sibling or your parents. And those are three rules that parents can understand Children hear me say these rules. And then when they break the rules, they know, hey, listen, I, I was told I shouldn't sleep with this phone. I am, I feel a little guilty. But then at least you're advocating for the parent to say, listen, take the phone away and put it out. You know, let Dr. D be the bad guy. Because parents are fighting, we're always fighting with our kids about something. At least we could say, listen, this is what the eye doctor said, 
I'm just following through on the doctor's advice. Right. And that's got to be, you know, uh, parents today, man, they're my heroes with COVID. And I live next to a school and they weren't back two days before they sent everybody back <laughs> home after the holidays because of COVID exposure. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, how do you rationalize that with a child when you're like, hey, you got to be in front of a computer all day for school, but now I'm going to take your device away from you. It's, yeah. it's it, like, it I, my and, heart goes yeah, out for sure. Uh, exactly. And that's why I think that 20 minutes, just look how passionate you are about this topic. And I'm assuming you're not a parent, but yes, you're very uh, engaged in this topic. Just by us as optometrists, giving parents three to five minutes on this topic is a huge, what we refer to in our office as a critical non-essential. This is a Patty Lund, who's that Australian dentist that talks about, this is not essential to a good fitting ortho K lens. It's probably not essential to myopia management, but it's critical to engaging the parent in our care, knowing we care enough to spend five minutes to say, listen, nobody knows the answer, but we can all agree probably your child sleeping with their phone, looking at it until they fall asleep and popping awake in the morning and looking at it is not a good thing. We could all agree on that. And as a healthcare provider, I'm saying, leave the phone outside the room. That's it. You don't have to listen to me. But that, that really engages parents in our care. So that's included in the 20 minutes. It's included every three months when they follow up uh, with us. Yeah. And uh, that advice to keep the phone out of the room, I do that uh, after yeah, Dr. I D do suggested too. it. <laughs> like I, I was like, because I, you know, you look at your phone until you're, it's time for bed and then you put it down and then it's the yeah. first thing you pick up and look at when you get yeah, up. Absolutely. So that phone's outside the room now. So That's right. definitely That's great right. advice for adults as well. And I took my own advice because I was taken into my room until my wife goes, maybe you should follow your own advice. You know, <laughs> yeah. you're on that too much. And she was a hundred percent right. So now I leave totally. it downstairs. Yeah. yeah. I get much better sleep if I read a book or just sit there and like meditate and relax before bed because my brain is book, so busy. Something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. For sure. And we supplement this. It's good for the listeners and the viewers to know this. I pull all these articles. We have at least 50 articles in a Pendaflex folder uh, in our exam room, a USA Today article that says why you're addicted to your phone and what to do about it. And the number one suggestion is proximity matters. So they know this is not just Dr. D pulling out these recommendations from his hat, maybe they think Dr. D is old fashioned. I'm not sh sure what they're thinking. Maybe they think I'm one of the few doctors who care. But regardless, I'm showing them a handout that says proximity matters. The further the, the device is away from us, the less we think about it. Yeah, and I think that I, I love what you said there. You're gonna show the patient you care because I think a lot of doctors are hesitant to mention things like nutrition, technology use, lifestyle. But ultimately, you are showing the patient that you do care about them. If the if the you're showing the parent that you care about that child. So I'm glad you brought that yeah. up. Yeah. All right, let's get to the second question, which is: Do you measure axial length at each visit? What do you think, Doctor D? Yeah, we we skimmed on that. I don't know if anybody knows what what at first we would do it yearly. Uh, that to me makes the most sense. We're doing it more often recently because we want to develop our own normative data. Uh, a scan, I think practitioners have been uh, encouraged to get it, and it makes sense, but it's still very, very new. And it's, it, although the data is coming out on what's normal growth versus abnormal growth, we know it may vary between ethnicity, it may vary amongst gender. It, there's many factors. So for us, we know we don't want to go in that rabbit hole of having the patient ask us every visit, how's their refraction? Because that's what will happen. How is their measurements, their A scan? Because they are not at a point where, where they know enough. Like we'll know the refraction may vary every three months. That a minus a quarter today may not be a minus a quarter over refraction the next visit. But parents like numbers. So we don't mention it to the parent, but we're monitoring it so we can get data from our instrument in our office. We talk about this twice. We talk about it at their consultation, their first visit with us, and at their yearly exam, but not at every visit, although we may measure it. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I've heard some 
doctors will measure it on every pediatric patient. And uh, aside from it just being useful data, they've echoed what you said that it like it's important to have information that you can show the parent directly. Uh, so that's a very useful tool. But to you have, have to be careful because parents have a, a, a way of fixating on numbers because they're tangible. Mm -hmm. But we still don't know exactly what these numbers mean. You mm -hmm. know, we take them, we don't isolate, hey, the A scan has changed. You're looking at your refractions over the past three months. You're over refractured over the past three months. You're looking at the A scan. You're looking at how much pressure this child is under. We were talking about the pandemic. These poor kids right. are just stressed to the hilt. And I thought it was very compassionate of you to empathize not only with the parent, but with the kids. These kids are isolated. They've been yeah. isolated for two years. You grab that iPhone away from them. It's like your parents saying back in the day, you can't play with your friends. So it, it really is a tough time. So I'm very careful not to put excess pressure on the family at this time. And if I do think the myopia is creeping, that's the time to bring in the A scan. And that is the time to talk about maybe adding an ad adjunctive therapy like atropine or something of that nature to whatever you're doing. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I'm reminded about when you say like parents get fixated on certain things, I'm reminded about, uh, you know, the idea that like, <clears throat> if your kid is seeing and, and, and like the 2020 paradigm, right. My, well, my kid's seeing 2020, like, so why do we need new lenses? Like, let's just stick with the original pair. And it's like, well, you know, the, the whole point here is to retard the progression of myopia. Clear vision, you know, is great. Uh, and so you, you have to be careful about what the patient is going to become fixated on and explain. Right. And, and it's, it's all over the place. Pr experienced practitioners will tell you when they're 2025, 20, we feel that's good enough. We're sustaining myopia. Parents may want 2020. 20. I have kids who are 2020 20 and the parents are stressed. Maybe that's too sharp. Maybe the lens that you prescribe and you need to address those. That's what that 20 minute slot is. That's what every three minutes. So it's not only for objective measurements, it's really for the, like I talk about the conscious and subconscious concerns of parents. What are some subconscious concerns of parents and what are like, what are the main ones? Do you think side effects? Okay. Every parent, I have kids in this lens for 20 years and parents will still say to me, I heard, I read, my friend said that these lenses cause astigmatism, cause corneal scarring, cause infection. So not only do I address that concern, I give them papers that are published on the safety of overnight orthokeratology. The number two concern is, how do you know my child's eyes are not getting worse? So the concept of, okay, you haven't changed the parameters in two, three years, but once they stop, will their eyes go from minus two to minus nine because you've been holding it back with this rubber band, they have that analogy. So that's another subconscious concern of a parent is that, yeah, things are good now, but what will happen when we stop? Gotcha. Those are two very, very big ones. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And the third one is subconscious or conscious is, I know all this virtual learning, this distance learning, all these electronics can't be good for my kids. They just need a health provider to say they're not. And right. not, it's not the blue light, it's other factors. And that, again, goes into a conversation. So if you're only seeing the patient, I feel, this is me personally, every six months because they're stable, you're missing on a golden opportunity to educate your patient on good visual hygiene and answer their question. If I see them once a year, every six months, I'm overwhelmed. I'm just overwhelmed. Gotcha. Yeah, some great points. All right, let's get to the third question, which is, as far as fees go, do you have one fee per treatment modality or does it vary depending on the treatment you choose? Dr. D, what do you say? Yeah, that's a great question. We level our fees. We've talked about this before. We currently have six levels and we, pa practitioners always want, always want a cut and dry way of selecting it. For example, refraction. So let's say if you're minus one, maybe you're level one. If you're minus two, level two, et cetera. The way we determine it is the complexity of the case. I always say a six-year-old 
who's minus four, minus three, is very different than a 16-year-old who's minus three in my clinical experience. How many questions do the parents ask? You want to answer them. You just have to reimburse yourself for the time that is, uh, is needed to answer all these questions. How sensitive is the child? There's some kids, I had, I had two consults over the past two days. It just couldn't be more different. One would not let me put in an ortho K lens, just traumatized. And she was older. She was nine or 10. The other child was also nine or 10. He came back with the lenses and if nothing happened. So even if they're corneal shaped, and their objective measurements are the same. These are two very different cases. So what I've learned, me personally, my technician is much more qualified to put the level than I am because I always underestimate how much time is gonna be required to properly handle this patient. The way we do it in our office, my technician has dealt with the parent before the appointment, during the appointment, after the appointment, both families and child. Two, they know the keratometry reading. You know, we've trained them a flat case versus very steep case. We try the fitting lens and I'll tell them, hey, this is not going to do well with a conventional lens. We may have to do a, a wave topography driven design to, to really get this child fit properly. So they pick the level of six levels, depending on a multitude of factors, both objective and there are subjective findings. Very good question. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, it makes me think like it just reiterates that point of like getting your staff on board and making sure that they have a buy-in and are properly trained because they are integral to this process because you, the practitioner, can't do it all. Yeah, so I, yeah I, absolutely. I, My staff, I can honestly say, has saved me during this pandemic. I couldn't do it without them. We talked about mm -hmm. last time, I think, how do you hire staff? I right. thank them every day that the, the staff has helped us because they come in every day under adverse conditions. Number two, they follow our protocol, our safety protocol. But number three is they know that our staff appreciates the value that we provide to patients. As doctors, we primarily care about treating the patient, their eyes sometimes, just the staff really sees how we go far beyond. We've talked about this, Matt, from snacks to um, these virtual phone calls that this question, uh, this, this doctor submitted. We're spending time to make sure the child is not only successful, successful visually, successful optically, but also successful as much as we can emotionally, as, as much as we could play in that game. Definitely. It takes time. These 20 minute exams take time. They take effort. It's much easier for me to see a patient once a year, mm -hmm. but then I'm really just not optimizing the opportunity to really bond with the family. Right. Right. For sure. All right. We're going to, we're going to transfer to our last question and then we're going to let sure. Dr. D go. Uh, we got four viewers at the moment. So if anybody has any questions in the moment, they'd like to follow up with Dr. D, we can take care of those right now. So we're going to ask the last question. And if anyone has any questions they want to throw in live, then we can get those answered as well. All right. So the last question is lastly, do you charge differently from year two and on? As in, is the first year a bigger charge because it involves more chair time? Dr. D, what do you think? Yeah, I do. We, we actually have a two-year program. We've had this two-year program now for several years. I don't know if it's five years, but it's plus or minus one. And that has worked well because the majority of our patients, I would say over 99%, seek our care for myopia control. And it was just too much pressure on me and my staff and on the patient to get the child fit optimally and really know if I'm controlling the myopia as best as I can. So, and we've done this for our specialty care patients. For example, our keratoconics that wear specialty lenses, we've converted that to a two-year program because sometimes, Matt, it can take us three months just to get the patient in a routine of insertion, removal, care, relatively good fit. So we could start working on the fit three months. So two years is great. Year three and beyond, we have a maintenance program that's about 10% of the, 
of the program, the initial program. So if you paid $1,000 for this program, your maintenance program may be $100. If you pay $5,000, it'll be $500 a pass. That doesn't include the lenses. What that includes, Matt, is their comprehensive eye examination. That's when we do the A scans. That's when we go through the retina and any lattice and any white without pressure. We really explain this to the patient, comparing the data between years. We also, it includes all their follow-up checkups. It also includes shipping and other little smaller things. The thing it doesn't include is replacement of the lenses. So year three and beyond, we always recommend our maintenance program. If the patient is, let's say routine, we have patients wearing our, there are lenses for 20 years. They may not need a program, a maintenance program. Those are the ones that may come in every uh, six months. They're adults now and they'll pay per visit. They'll pay for their checkup and their exam and checkup. Really good question. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. So we're going to let Dr. D go because, uh, you know, everybody's got to get on with their day. Yeah. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, for future reference for our viewers, if you have any questions for Dr. D, send them to thecorrectedview at gmail.com, or you can put them in our Facebook group, uh, or you can send them directly to Dr. D. Uh, Nick, how would people get in touch with you on the internet if they were so through, inclined? Through uh, my office website, contact us at iCareProfessionals.com. Contact right. us at iCareProfessionals.com. All right. So we'll have Nick back on next month to answer a couple of practice management questions. And if you enjoy this content, uh, this this is the uh, F part in effort by members like Nick Despeditas. Uh, AAOMC members who give us their real life money uh, every year in, in dues to keep programming and, and promotions and content just like this. So if that's something that you want to see more of, head on over to AAOMC.org. We have a lot of benefits. Uh, we have a great community. So if you're interested in seeing more of this content or upping your game or becoming connecting with people like Nick on a regular basis, uh, go to AAOMC.org and consider becoming a member. All right. So, Nick, thank you very much. And You're for, welcome. I'll see you next month. Man. Definitely. Thanks again. Be All right. Well. Same. Bye. Bye-bye. Well, that's it for this episode of The Corrected View. And if you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to thank the standard members of the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control, whose annual dues and support make it possible for the AAOMC to put out education, awareness, and content like this. Mm -hmm. Also, like to give a special shout out that I'm going to be giving out at the end of every Corrected View episode for one full year. And that shout out goes to Dr. Somi O oh for her very generous contribution at the lifetime member level of our fundraiser. Thank you to everyone who contributed and keeping the AAOMC alive. You are awesome. <laughs>